Rob, how's it going? Hey, good, good. Happy Friday, Scott. Yeah, happy Friday. Uh, so we we were kind of discussing or talking about what we were going to potentially talk about on this episode, and the Q4 2020 market pulse report came out. I think it might be a week old or a week and a half old now, um, but it's still obviously the information is still quite relevant. And I thought, oh, why don't we just walk through that and kind of you know keep our conversation moving about it? But it also gives interesting data as things have changed in our new COVID marketplace, right? So the title- Absolutely, that, yeah. Yeah, so the title we're using here today is how has COVID affected business value and sales? And you know, the Q4 market update is out. So where <laughs> Finally. Uh, yeah, maybe we just to start at the top, like we were on the kind of before we started chatting, uh, we were just talking about how that, you know, the SIBA loan that's coming through is starting to show up on balance sheets for people. And you were just alluding a little bit to what your valuation experts do with that. Um, maybe just like start, we can start our conversation there and then we can pull up the report after. Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, so the SIBA, it's been starting to show up on financial statements and it's good actually. So that's the first thing to address is when you are doing the financials for your business, make sure that is a separate income line so that uh, buyers know that uh, that was used. Um, and uh, and it, it's very interesting because it's it's just a temporary income that is just to help at the moment so we don't we don't really consider it uh with the, the valuations going forward because that loan will not be available or at least so they say will not be available in the future so what are your thoughts on that have you seen it much yeah yeah the last two businesses that we've been working with it's on their balance sheet right it's, it's shown up as mm -hmm. a loan and i mean the challenge becomes and this kind of maybe is a segue into the report because you know, it's similar in the states with their ppp program but you have these extra loans that aren't going to come. You have this extra in the future, potentially. You have extra support that's coming through all the employee programs for playing uh, subsidizing employee wages uh, that may not be there in the future. So you're kind of looking at the financial statement and trying to do the best you can with it to project what it's going to be doing in the future. Uh, but I think the hang up is going to come and, you know, it's it's to be seen. But the hang up is going to come that now we have this loan that is, you know, the companies have been able to take $40,000 and they only have to pay $30,000 back. So now what does that look like when they're, you know, they're selling their company and how is that going to affect the buyer moving forward? If the buyer's doing a share purchase, then, okay, are we going to transfer that loan with the company uh, depending on how much has been used of it, right? Like say a business owner has only used maybe $5,000 of that loan, then, okay, well, there's $35,000 in cash and that's like can be can transfer with the company so it's just another thing to navigate basically and i think there's you know two ways of looking at it it's okay we can sell this money with the company and the buyer's getting this bonus 10 grand or like if a lot of that has been used up that loan's been used up well then the seller is going to have to obviously pay that off before the company sells with and use the you know the purchase the proceeds from the purchase to do so uh, but either way it uh, it is something that needs to be figured out again i think this might be the theme of our episodes is that kind of figure this step out before you go to market, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah, this is just yet another negotiation that we have to tackle along the process, right? Absolutely. I, I, I'm a bit of a believer that um, it was the business that got the loan, so it should stay with the business, but I have yeah. definitely seen the negotiations where the, the seller uses it. But um, yeah, yeah, yeah to, each business is unique, right? Cool, uh, yeah, for sure. So I'm gonna pull up this report and we can just kind of scan through it, but it's got some interesting things in it. And for those you know that are have never seen this report before, there's an organization called the IBBA, which is down here, and they also operate the M&A Source. And there's kind of like two different tiers of this organization because one represents businesses that are on the you know the main street market businesses doing under five hundred thousand dollars a year in EBITDA, basically. Uh, that is like revenue cash that's taken home at the end of the day is under five hundred thousand dollars. And then the M&A source basically, you know, represents as a body, looks after those businesses that are doing over that $500,000 a year in EBITDA, uh, pushing, you know, upwards to, you know, five, 10, $50 million in EBITDA, right? So uh, the, the report kind of, as you kind of go through the report, it breaks it down essentially into those two segments because they're, they're quite different. And then I know for us, like kind of in our business, and, you know, I think for most part for you, we're dealing with businesses that are kind of on that like lower side of the spectrum. Uh, versus the you know five million dollars in EBITDA and up. Yeah, 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 for 
for sure. So, no, I, I love that this report comes out that uh, kind of it, it uh, shows people that I'm not crazy. Like uh, the things that I'm talking about are are actually justified by this. <laughs> so I love yeah. it's a little validating. I think the biggest question from sellers, and I mean, is you know, what's my company worth, right? And these reports, oh, yeah. they do a really good job of determining what that is because, again, like just so for people that are watching. The way that these things are put together is they just basically survey brokers uh, over the course of the year for that quarter. Um, they survey brokers what's going on, and then every broker that like, completes a deal, they put that data into the, these databases and in, into this Market Pulse report so that you know it aggregates it. And then you have a general idea of like what's happening in the marketplace, which is pretty amazing. Um, so this yeah, page, really. like we talked about this a little bit because this is talking about how the loans are affecting uh, transactions, and the the main takeaway here was. You know, it's slowing things down because of uncertainty. I would say that that was the main mm -hmm. takeaway of this page. Uh, and then this gets into a little bit of taxes because, and this is for our, like our U.S. watchers, which is like who knows uh, who's gonna be watching the video. But it is interesting because the the Biden uh, like the with the Biden plan, whatever it might be, I don't know what, what exactly it's called, but uh, their tax plan it it's changing capital gains potentially. And so yeah. if you sell a business that's doing over, that sells for more than a million dollars, you're gonna be paying double in capital gains potentially as of 2022. So- Well then how about on that note, let's let's yeah. let's reference um, at least locally here then. So yes, taxes are, are gonna be applicable and an asset share versus a share sale are going to um, uh, impact you differently. So obviously you always want to check with your accountant for your specific scenario, but do you, do you recall offhand what the capital gains exemption is? Uh, it's in and around yeah. 900,000. I don't think it's nine yet. It's maybe around 840, no. 60, something around. Okay. There. That's what yeah, it is. Yeah. It's, it's pegged a little bit to inflation. So it goes up and down, but, uh, the mm -hmm. big, the big piece and like what you're probably alluding to here is that if you sell as a share sale, you can capitalize on that in Canada and avoid avoid taxes up to, you know, that $860,000 mark, which is pretty great. Yeah. So that's a question to ask your, uh, your accountant is, does, does the capital gains exemption apply to me with my sale? Um, definitely ask that question. Yeah. <laughs> because if you can't, uh, anyway, that's the, that's the one that can be painful if you don't ask that question early because it can cost yeah. you in the hundreds of thousands of dollars. And that's always a uh, pain in the buns when you lose like 400K for no reason because you forgot to ask that yeah. question. So ask your accountant about the capital gains exemption and make sure that your company, when you're Canadian, uh, make sure your company is actually set up so that you can apply for it. Uh, so that, okay. So now we're getting to the actual market data, right? And I, I there this, we go. this one was like super interesting to me. Uh, and because this chart, although it's like small here, and if someone's watching the YouTube video, you might want to like expand it up so you can see it. Uh, but this chart basically is the sentiments from brokers in the marketplace, whether they feel it is a buyer's market or a seller's market. And that's trended over time. Uh, and it's also looks here like this chart up here, which actually you can't see my mouse, but I'm like highlighting the top part of the chart. That's this <laughs> last quarter. All right. Uh, and like, what did you feel about this when you saw this? Uh, well, uh, I, I thought it was interesting that they, they thought it was like the seller's market um, because, again, like there were a few few buyers that would reach out to me. They're like, hey, I'm looking for a bargain. Um, well, I guess that was more apl applicable to the quarter two and three. And as you can see, yeah, it's actually trending up from there. So, yeah, I, I believe that. Um, um, yeah, that's a tough one. It's definitely trended up from from quarter two, which I would say is correct. How about you? Well, my, like the thing that I took away from this, which was like the the big aha for me in this chart, was that if your company is doing under that five hundred thousand dollars a year in earnings, then mm -hmm. there there never has been a seller's market for you, and like going all the way back to two thousand and thirteen. Like if you look at the bottom chart, right, and if your company is doing you know over five million dollars, then you've just like comfortably always been in the seller's market. And so, yeah. you know, what that says to me, and because this data goes all the way back to 2013, at least what's displayed, I think it goes back further than that, uh, is that, okay, the, you know, the more earnings you can get for your, in your company, the, the more you grow your company, uh, the less companies are out there that you're competing with. So all of a sudden, like now you're, you're continually and perpetually in this seller's market, right? Whereas, True. you know, if yeah. you're, dealing with the, if you have a smaller business, which kind of represents, you know, 85, 90% of the marketplace, 
uh, there's just a lot of other people out there that you're competing against. So you are, you know, perpetually in a buyer's market. So it's, uh, that's, that's a good look. Yeah. I think that explains it very well. Yeah. So I, that, that's kind of what I got out of this one, which was, which was interesting and, uh, you know, probably reflects reality. And then the next, the next part of our chart here for the kind of go forward to the next page, uh, this is, this is more what people I think are trying to ask, like ask about, right. It's like, okay, so who's, who's buying these companies. Right. And I found like, did, did you, was this one a shocker to you at all? Or is this kind of, you know, par for the course? No, no, no. It's definitely first time individuals, especially, um, under the 2 million there. Um, I would, yeah, I would agree with that hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And it's yeah. like, so, so this page is basically saying, okay, if you have a business that is in the happy deal maker channel is all about, you know, educating business owners that are doing under that $5 million in revenue. So if you're, then that's represented this top of this chart here where it says there's, you know, 73%, but you know, everyone's always optimistic about selling to, you know, competitors or they want to sell to a bigger company or, you know, they, they want to sell to somebody who is, you know, a, a serial investor that's always buying businesses. Uh, but the real, the vast majority of people that are purchasing companies of that size, it, like what this chart says and what's actually happening in the marketplace uh, is first time buyers that are, you know, individuals. And again, that goes for the size of the business. So the, the upper, like you can kind of look at upper and lower charts at the same time. Um, mm -hmm. Definitely the, the business is um, a little less in value there. Yes, it's going to be the, the first time uh, entrepreneurs looking to, to jumpstart their, their career. And then if you look at the bottom one, then you can kind of see that the seasoned uh, businesses are now acquiring a little bit more. So the seasoned businesses are looking for those bolt-ons for their current mm -hmm. businesses to, to further their value. So um, yeah, I definitely see this in the, in the marketplace. Yeah. And it seems to kind of, it's interesting that they're breaking this up here. Uh, buyers were individuals and the, the purchase price of under $2 million, right? So that's kind of seems to be, um, well, a tipping point, I suppose, between when you can really crack over until let's call it like institutional investment where, you know, strategic buyers and like private equity companies are coming in and they're, they're looking and they're interested in these companies that are more than worth more than $2 million. Um, so that, that's kind of an interesting stat. Uh, I thought that came out of the, out of the report there. And then yep. uh, this is, so this is the whole, the, our whole show, right? It's like, okay, what's oh, actually yeah. episode? It's like, what is actually happening in the marketplace this last quarter, right? And I mean, this last quarter has been heavily affected by the, in the COVID environment. Um, so it, it really is an indication of what's going on here as far as business valuation. And that's what, it, what things are actually selling for, which is, you know, what I think is more important. It's like, okay, you know, not what we're dreaming of selling for, what things are actually selling for. And that's what this page is telling us about. So anything that jumped off on this one for you? Um, I have to admit, I, I jumped right to the multiples. I kind of, yeah, I kind of sure. skipped a little bit over the, the business valuing trending. Yeah. Like that's a like percent of, cause that's, that's representing uh, asking price versus closing price. And that. Uh, that can change. That's very dependent on the business uh, and who buys it. So I don't know. There's way too many variables in that in that graph, if you ask me. But I jumped right to the to the multiples, and uh, I love this because this is yeah the base. The basic question is how much is my business worth? And there you go. Historically, um, that's the, that's the numbers. And what I like to point out is how steady the numbers are. Yeah. Um, like under 500, it's like two, 1.8, two. Two and actually look historically two 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 point three two two. It's so it's very very stable and even in, amidst the, a complete lockdown in the country, it only dropped down point two. So um, yeah, very very sturdy. And as you see, under five hundred kind of dips. The rest of them actually bumped up. Uh, mm -hmm. So again, like the higher value businesses are kind of proving how resilient they are and how uh, needed they are by the communities. So that's what I saw. What did you see? Yeah, that, I mean, that's exactly what I saw here, which was incredibly interesting to me, because as you sit th with this report, kind of before you crack it open, you have your preconceived notions of what's going to be on the inside of it, right? And you're thinking, all right, well, because of, you know, what's happening in the marketplace, business valuations are, you know, going to drop for sure. And likely the multiples that they're selling for are going to drop as well. Um, but they haven't. They just seem to, especially in that like, that lower market, uh, in that main street market down here in this like 500 below 500 K that is kind of like where our sweet spot would operate. 
it just seems to consistently be that two times seller's discretionary earnings, uh, which for you know the listeners are, that's just essentially the earnings that you take home at the end of the day, uh, plus your salary on top of it. So really- But that's here's, that's here's to point that out. So the first yeah. three uh, rows there are seller's discretionary earnings, which is, is uh, EBITDA plus owner's wage. Yeah. And then the bottom two are just EBITDA. Again, that's uh, when you break into that higher, um, I guess revenue stream or value, you now have management in place and you're not you're not an owner operator typically. Mm -hmm. So that's something to take away there is is the multiple is being applied to a slightly different number, um, a slightly different kind of form of cash flow. Now, with that said, when you apply these multiples, it is to a seller's discretionary earning or an EBITDA, but of a three to five year average. Yes. So again, like all uh, businesses decide to take their business off off the marketplace because they wanted to wait for the pandemic to disappear and uh, and life to return to to the normal. And uh, unfortunately, though, um, we're still taking 2020 into consideration three to five years down the road. So yes, you can wait for the pandemic to end, but those financials will still be counted. The year did still happen. We can't just void an entire year out of out of a business, right? So something to keep in mind, if you're waiting for the pandemic to end before you're listing, we're still gonna have to consider 2020 financials. It's it's just really the rule of, of business valuation. Yeah, I mean, it's still gonna be included for sure. I think that I, it, it's hard for sellers and it's also difficult for buyers to, to think about, okay, when when do they wanna acquire? And you know when do they wanna sell? Trying to navigate through these waters. But I, I guess like my takeaway and my advice right there for that would be, just do the exact same thing you would normally do anyhow, which is like run your business with a focus of making it as sellable as possible and putting as much value in it as you can. And then, and then you should be doing that anyway. Right. So it's like, don't, don't change what you would be doing if you're thinking about selling, because what this, what this report is showing us is like, okay, values are kind of still staying steady for those quality companies that are actually selling. Because I think it might also be warranted to say here that this report is only based off of businesses that sold. So it, yes. it doesn't factor in at all businesses that tried to sell and didn't sell. So these are like only companies that sold. Um, so just, you know, do what you're going to do anyhow. Keep building value in your company. Do the best you possibly can for the 2020, 2021 year. And, that, yeah, and it's going to put you in the best position to sell later or it's going to put you in the best position to sell now. It doesn't matter. So... Love it. Yeah, that's the golden rule. Just make sure you're you're valuable, right? Um, but like you're building up the value of your business. And that's even when you're listed, right? Like don't be putting the or taking the, the foot off the gas pedal. You need to be continually building the business even when you're listed. For sure. This quote from David Ryan that's in the report here, I found pretty interesting because it says businesses impacted by COVID are still selling in this market. Um, this is from a financial group. He said one structure we're seeing is that buyers are basing multiples on current performance and then structuring an earn out based on seller's 2019 value, um, which is interesting, right? So it's like basically buyers are saying, okay, I'm gonna pay you for what your company is worth today uh, in this current environment, because we really don't know, we haven't seen the end of this, so we don't know how it's gonna turn out in the future, um, but we're gonna base our earn out on the 2019 numbers. So assuming that when things go back to normal, the business is gonna revert back to what it was making in, in the years pre-COVID, uh, then that's what they're basing the earnouts off of. And you know, for listeners, like earnouts are basically that chunk of payment you're going to get if you hit a specific target in the future uh, after your business sells. So that that's an that was an interesting um, quote in there as well. How many earnouts do you typically see? Uh, like in our, in our size of transactions that we do, we don't see a ton of them, right? So when the businesses get a little bit bigger, so they're selling for that above million dollars a year or above million dollars, you start seeing them. I feel, I find that that's when they, they track in. But that's a good segue because it brings us to <laughs> this next chart, which I don't know if you like led me right into that. I, I did, yeah. So <laughs> that's exactly, that was a very fun quote that, that they placed there because it's, it's the very next chart here. You can see that very little earnouts actually happen, uh, especially in the, the uh, sub 500,000. Um, but even then, when you get up to five to 50 million, it's only 5% up from 2%. So really not a whole lot of earnout activity out there. Yeah, which I, I actually found that interesting. You know, I think for people that are watching this, that are thinking about selling their company. What is the thing that I would pull out of this is that if you look across the board, it doesn't matter what the size of the company is. 
that cash at close is landing around that 85% mark. And this yeah. is across the board, right? Uh, and I know in my experience from sellers, when you meet with sellers and you kind of sit down and, and I always ask the questions, like, are you willing to take, you know, a vendor take back in this deal that is finance a, a portion of it for the buyer? Uh, the answer to that question is invariably always 100% of the time, no. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah exactly yeah oh oh yeah yeah uh, well yeah exactly it, i would say 95 percent, and then the other five percent would be what's the vendor take back and then you explain it and then it becomes a no um <laughs> yeah exactly so yes exactly yeah but, the, but this um, that, yes and sorry sorry rob this shows that oh, yeah, I, go I, ahead. it's like at the end of the deal when the transaction is actually complete this is reporting on companies that did sell uh, 85% of the, like 85% of the cash at close. That's what people are getting. Right. And then the rest of it is yeah. you know, using seller financing, using an earn out or some retained equity. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, I think later on in the report report, we kind of look at why they start selling and, um, yeah, definitely sellers for the most part, just want a clean, easy exit. Um, mm -hmm. and yeah, they don't, they don't want to be anchored. Um, however, when you do the vendor take back, it really, really, really helps out the buyer, uh, sets them up for success because more financing is more, uh, is, becomes available when, when lenders see that the owner is willing to either do a vendor take back, an earn out, or even like the last column, their retained equity, then people are far more willing to, to lend to the businesses. So it's a little, it's a little unfortunate that we don't see more of it, but I can definitely mm. understand the seller's point of view, right? Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, the nice thing about being in our shoes is you can understand both both sides, right? Yeah. Especially having sold companies of, you know, our own and that kind of thing. Uh, so you get it, but it it just this just is the data, and you can't like I love the fact you can't really argue with the data, right? It like it is what it yeah. is. Uh, most of these deals, it's not you're not getting all cash at close. And I will also say that part of the reason why it isn't all cash at close is by giving a vendor take, but allows you to push up your purchase price, right? So you can kind of stretch out a little bit from what the buyer has, like the cash they have available today, that stretches it up, it kind of moves it up a little bit so you can actually sell your company for more uh, if you have that seller financing in place. It's a little riskier, but yeah, it could definitely help out your retirement. Like if you wanted to have a little bit more income coming in monthly, um, it, it, it can work in your favor, but it's all about how much risk you want to take on at that point in time, right? Yeah, for sure. Um, and then the other thing that people usually ask is like, how long does it take to sell my business, right? And this page talks to that as well, which is, you know, how did you feel? Are you finding this consistent with in the marketplace for the businesses that you're selling that these numbers are, you know, fairly accurate? The when I answer that question everybody is surprised this is not at all like selling a home especially in the market today in bc um mm. it's uh it's definitely a bit of a commitment when you do this so when you're looking to sell um be prepared there's a bit of a journey ahead of us um actually i was a little bit surprised on this one yeah. i expected the difference between 2019 to 2020 would be vastly different because when we do our due diligence period uh it's not so much finding the buyers as it is just the due diligence that takes longer when yeah. the lawyers go out to, to reach out to cra and uh and all those other uh background checks to see if there's any liens or anything in place it just takes that much longer for them to get back to you with the the yay or nay right so it's it's not the buyer it's just the uh, waiting for people that aren't in the office anymore they're working from home um i guess less staff uh, mm. I, that's where i find the the timeline was stretched how about you yeah for sure like it is interesting that it didn't change and to be honest with you when i looked at this I'm like, mm, it seems and this is a, the last thing any seller wants to hear is like it seems kind of low <laughs> like this seems kinda, <laughs> yeah actually kind of <laughs> quick you know and yeah. i mean you can make these numbers lower if you wanted to. You're like, oh, I really want to sell my business tomorrow. Fine. And then you can just move the price and just drop your price and it'll sell quicker, right? But I think if you really want to maximize value in your company sale, you this says seven months to close in this report, but I would add a, little, a couple more months of that so that from the time to get prepared and get things ready uh, to, to really, truly maximize your value. Um, and then it, you it hit also a huge point there. Yeah. Um, well, I was just going to talk to your one point there of price is that I've, if anything is going to change the, the purchase time frame, mm -hmm. price is, is definitely been the most effective. I've seen a gas station actually complete within four weeks, and then I've seen marinas take two years. Yeah. So it's, uh, yeah, no, I guess it does average out to, to this, but uh, yeah, it could go either way.
For sure. And then I think the number is, and what I always say to people is like, it really is that, you know, the time before you get to that letter of intent, which is broken down in, in this report, when someone makes that initial offer that gets signed, that time should be, you know, should be pretty standard. It's like, how much time does it take you to get through due diligence once you've got an accepted offer? Uh, and that's showing us on businesses that are, you know, the main street, smaller businesses, that's taking about two months and for larger businesses taking up to four months. And I mean, I would even say that that four number is like pretty low for these really high, like really larger yeah. businesses because diligence can, you know, can last a bit longer than that. And I'm surprised that that number is that low, especially during this period of time where there's so much uncertainty. Yeah, absolutely. But yeah, so that was a little bit of a shocker that uh, it's so, so low and so consistent. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I guess the big takeaway is the consistency across the board. So uh, this one, did this one hit you? This exit planning chart? <laughs> Not at all. No, it didn't? Oh, it actually surprised no. me a tiny bit. Yeah. So it, like, well, so actually, that, that it's so high, or sorry, so low uh, of retirement planning. Yeah, nobody, uh, very few plan for retirement. What do you see? Well, I don't know. I, I I mean, you're, I mean, this exit planning space, you run the exit plan summit. It's like, you're kind of all constantly beating the drum. It's like, Hey, let's plan to exit, but maybe I need to change my tune a little bit of, you know, planning to exit where it's just like, Hey, let's, let's plan to make a quality company. Uh, let's make an asset that's sellable. And then that might be the message to spread because it doesn't like, I actually don't really think it matters if you're like, you're planning to exit. You really just need to be planning to make a good company. And then it's, then it's yeah. ready and it's, it's, it, it can be ready to rock and roll. Uh, but this chart here, it what it says is for businesses that are, you know, in in that again our our sweet spot, uh, eighty percent of them are not even thinking about it, like not even, not yeah. even a thought, like not even nope. planning, zero. I'm like ah, well maybe people that watch this video is like okay maybe just even a little bit, like just a little bit. Yeah, just, yeah. just a thought would be nice. <laughs> yeah. A little bit goes a long way for sure. And I guess what people maybe don't understand is that exit planning, every little bit you do for that, it really just is value enhancement of your company. Maybe we should just start calling it value enhancement because that's essentially what it is at the end of the day. Um, yeah. So that was this this one. And then this is just interesting, I think, just like what's what are people buying, you know, as far as, you know, industry and sector segmentation. Uh, and I found this one, you know, interesting because it was just pretty much even across Actually, can the we board. I would like to actually talk to the, the last page just a little bit yeah. more. Um, just so I have a saying, don't wait till you're tired to retire yeah. um, far too many times. And it's really, really, really sad. Like I, I love business and I love to see everybody else's success. Um, but when the, uh, when, when the, I guess the senior members come and reach out to me and they're interested about uh, selling the business, mm -hmm. they have let, their foot off the gas pedal for too many years and they know very well and they've proven that this, it could be a very successful business and there's lots of sales to, to be had but because they have haven't been keeping up with that performance over the last three to five years which is where we make the average or where we look to predict the future of the business mm -hmm. um, it's it's too far gone so again don't wait till you're tired to retire and also start the conversation with your kids early because far too often the kids see how hard you've been working in your business and as great as it has treated you they just don't want to have that same lifestyle so again very common to see um folks looking to retire and their kids actually decided not to take on the family business for that reason so um ha start having conversations as like today today um yesterday as soon as you possibly can just start talking to everybody hey, hey are you interested yes no if not okay i need to start considering something else so i just wanted to throw that in there before we head to the, to the next uh page there yeah i think that's uh, really good advice and that that advice what you just said that can happen with a beer it can happen with a glass of wine it can yeah. happen over like it doesn't matter like you don't really it can be done in a relaxed environment like just what just yeah. what are we doing with this company and just get the ball started rolling, right? Okay, so this is like, like I said, this, this is interesting. It seems like all sectors are pretty much selling almost equally in the main street yeah. for sure. And then, you know, as you move up the market, the value chain a little bit, uh, it, it, it segments out a little bit more, but I think it's, you know, it's pretty consistent across the board. And I know this is like hard to see, but uh, these it's just talking about kind of restaurants versus, uh, like service businesses and healthcare businesses and construction companies, but uh, yeah, it's pretty even.
Yeah, okay, so my takeaway on this one, um, yes, how consistent it is across uh, the, the industries, and two, look how strong restaurants still are. Like, they yeah. were said to be one of the hardest hit industries from the pandemic, uh, recession, uh, and look at them. They're still, they're still trading hands, uh, so that is fantastic to see, that at least a, a sub, sub two million. Yeah, for sure. And we've, you know, we sold a restaurant during this pandemic and we've got a letter of intent last week at another restaurant during the pandemic. So it is, I mean, that's what we've been seeing in the market for sure. Uh, it's obviously, you know, the deals are a little bit slower. People are more uh, cautious about them because, you know, there, there's a little bit of uncertainty. Due diligence goes a little bit longer, but there's, it's still happening. I think everyone knows that, you know, we, it, in our heart, we know we want to go back out to restaurants and dine out. Like it's such a, it's a yeah. big part of our culture. And uh, I know that industry is going to rebound. Um, and I think, I think buyers yeah. know that too, right? I can't wait for that day again. Um, but I, I wish they could have broken it down a little bit more because I bet you a lot of that would have been quick serve restaurants, a little bit more of the fast food and franchise. Um, at least what I was seeing, it was definitely a lot more on that front than yeah. say uh, pubs. Um, yeah. yeah. For sure. Yeah. Um, and I think that's the end. Yeah, that's the end of the report. And this is a shot of Pepperdine University. <laughs> like, uh, just nice. a little bit south of Malibu. Uh, it would, it's like partnered and putting this report together. But I think I'd like I'd like to just thank, I'll scoot back to the beginning, so to the IBBA for putting this together and everybody that kind of puts the data yeah. into it for it to make it happen. Because uh, that's, it's a lot of work for them to put this report together every single quarter. And it's really helpful for people that are thinking about selling their companies and the actors and players that are within this industry. Yeah, no, it's it's huge. But again, take away that um, this is only sold businesses. Um, mm -hmm. I've been trying to find a stat or at least a reliable stat. I've seen it. Uh, I've seen it outdated, but only like 80 percent of uh, sorry, 20 percent of businesses that list for sale actually sell. Uh, I'm trying to I'm trying to find the source of this. Uh, I, I keep hearing it around the industry. Uh, like I've looked on our local MLS. Uh, but again, with with our industry, there's a lot of um, silos of, of data. They're not all joined up in one location, but definitely looking uh, through our local MLS, which uh, some businesses transact through, only 13.4% actually sold in 2020. Um, mm -hmm. I think a lot of that has to do with, like you said, like, there ha like the business has to be sellable. There has to be value there to the next uh, person, uh, as well as expectations on selling price have to be there. And I'm very thankful that uh, this comes out. It kind of helps us uh, uh, I guess paint a more thorough picture to the business owners that want to sell that hey this is this is what the industry is this isn't this isn't us just pulling random numbers out this is North America wide right yeah for sure and I mean to get to your point of the kind of finding that data where it's like how many businesses that try actually succeed in that sale process that was a mm -hmm. big question that I had uh, leading leading into that summit that we did and Nunzio uh, Presla he he owns a sell a small bit or sorry, a buy and sell a business.com. And it's kind of one of the bigger sites in Canada for business sales. And he said that 40% of their listings sell. And I thought that was, like, oh, that was a really nice good. high number. Um, and I asked him like, you know, what is that attributed to? Uh, and I think he, he thinks it's part and partial that one of the major things they do with their site is education. So it gets people in that right price bandwidth that you yeah. talked about, because if you're, if you're not in the right price bandwidth, and I mean, a lot of sites you can go to and like for us that are you know in the space day in and day out you can just scroll through those and go there's no chance there's no chance there's no chance right um, <laughs> sadly but when you get to say, okay this you know this one makes sense like going back to that sde number of two 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 year over year yeah. over year over year right um so you, you can see something that's like in that price point like, okay this has a chance right it'll actually potentially you know be sold uh, so I think they do a big, a, a good job of that with their site. And I did ask that question to Bob House as well at Biz, um, Biz Buy Sell, which is kind of the largest site in North America for yeah. companies. Um, and he didn't have like a clear, direct answer to that because he's like, we don't really know because people will post their business up and then they'll take their business down. And it, it doesn't mean like they might have sold it and that's why they took it down. Or they might have, you know, just decided like, we're going to go and try and sell it later or it might have failed to sell and, you know, I just shut its doors. So they, they don't really know that. He's like, the only reason why they know some of that information is because the brokers that are part of their network uh, report back, uh, you know, the sale numbers and, and success or failure kind of thing. 
Uh, but again, I said, oh, those numbers aren't 100% accurate because brokers are really selective about what businesses they take on. And so you're already like kind of narrowing the field to what's what's sellable in the first place because the you know the broker's done that pre-screening process up front. So that data is not even 100 percent accurate, right? <laughs> no, right? Yeah, it's uh, it, it's tough to come across data, but I'm I'm liking that more and more of it is becoming available. So it's just a matter of time before, or well, actually, just the more that we use it, the more people contribute, the more that it comes available. It's just a, a nice uh, flywheel that uh, is, should be should be becoming more and more reliable as the years come. Yeah, I agree. Rob, thanks for dropping in. <laughs> of course, I love it. This is great. That was a good episode, yeah. And so, I mean, for those that, you know, I would send people directly to this report, uh, but it is kind of a report that is, you know, you're supposed to be part of the IBBA to be have access to it. And so make sure that you, you know, if you're getting a broker and you're working with somebody that they, they're part of that organization because it gives them a little bit of a leg up. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, they'll be able to share it with you. So anyway, we'll catch you, uh, you know, next week or, you know, week after whatever. Yeah. Till our next episode. <laughs> exactly. All right. Take care, man. Okay. Talk to you.